So I'm very pleased to introduce Tim Harford, who's going to be doing our first um, provocative talk of the day. Uh, we had Martin provoking us yesterday with uh, his experiences around the U. Um, I'd just like to briefly introduce Tim and then hand over to him. Uh, Tim is a writer and an economist and a thinker. Uh, his career has included experiences as varied as working for Shell and working as the assistant to the chief economist at the ITF. And uh, more recently, he's known as the undercover economist. Uh, he writes a column by that name and published a book, which I understood sold over a million. Um, so you've got a best-selling author in our midst. And his new book, which is coming out in a couple of months, is called um, Adapt. 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 How success begins with failure. So we're here to learn about how to adapt, how to innovate with complex challenges. Um, and uh, Tim is going to be bringing that. He also uh, has a show on the BBC, um, has uh, his writing syndicated in well-known publications around the world. So I anticipate this is going to be not only a very enlightening, uh, encouraging session for us, but also a very entertaining one. So Tim, over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about problem solving in a complex world. Let's start with a simple challenge. Uh, I, I just want to quickly ask if you raise your hands if this morning for breakfast you had toast. OK, I didn't actually. I put it, so it's about 50 50 here. So let us reflect for a moment on the miracle of the toast. So this is courtesy of a design student. Uh, called Thomas Thwaites, who had uh, an interesting project a couple of years ago. He called it the Toaster Project. You can tell he's a design student because it takes you a long time before you can actually see the toaster in this image. <laughs> They're all too clever by half. So Thomas Thwaites decided he, he, he had a dream. And his dream was that he was going to, by himself, single-handedly, make a toaster. Let us admire the toaster. This is the toaster. It costs um, £3.99 at Argos, a popular store. So £3.99 is about 40 minutes' work at the minimum wage. Um, and Thomas Thwaites had this vision. He was going to build a simple toaster. So the first thing he did was to buy a toaster, uh, much like the, um, the one he, you could see at Argos. He bought the toaster. He dismantled the toaster. And he found out it had over 300 components and subcomponents. And many, many different materials. So you had, you had uh, wires, you had computer uh, elements, you had materials such as plastic for the all-important looking casing. You have to have the plastic, otherwise it doesn't look very nice. Also, you get electrocuted. Um, you have to have mica, it's a kind of slate. You wrap the heating element around. You need, to, you need iron for the heating element. You need nickel for the wire uh, to plug into the mains. You need a large number of different materials and many, many different components. So Thomas Thwaites set out by himself to make a toaster. So um, the first thing he needed was iron ore. This is iron ore. He, he decided, would, where do you get iron ore from? You go to an iron mine. So Thomas is British. He realized we no longer have any functioning iron mines anywhere in the United Kingdom. He, he called up an, a museum that used to be in an iron mine. He said, I'm a design student. I want to make a toaster. Can I get some iron? They said, yeah, sure, come on down. So he went down. It was in Wales. He went down to Wales. So it's a, about a three-hour journey on the train. <coughs> he got to this museum. They gave him some posters uh, of pictures of iron. He said, well, you're, a design, you're a design student. You wanted to make a, a poster. No, no, no. I wanted to make a toaster, <laughs> not a poster. <laughs> anyway, they were very, you know, they quickly, they quickly adjusted. Very kind people. Um, so they gave him this suitcase full of iron ore. Of course, then you have, so how do you make iron from iron ore? Not easy. Here's one way. Um, so this is a, um, this is a, uh, a bin, uh, sort of an aluminum bin, um, and a leaf blower. And he's trying to create sufficient heat in this bin by blowing air into the bin to smelt the iron. Turns out this doesn't work, OK? Just for reference, in case you're ever thinking of it. Also, it's kind of a cheat, because the leaf blower is a much more complicated and expensive technology than the toaster. So you're using a more complicated technology to make a less complicated technology. So anyway, he, he, he looked around, he investigated, and it turns out, very recently, there's been a new technique developed 
for smelting iron in a microwave. <laughs> so um, this is the second microwave. You, <laughs> you don't want to see the first microwave. However, this kind of worked. Although even then he said, it's not clear when you've actually got iron. So you said, how do you know you've got iron? How do you know, you know, you, you lick it and, you know. Um, so he had to make these compromises. So now he's using a microwave to make a toaster. He's using more complex technologies to make simpler technologies. So what, what other compromises he had to make. How do you get nickel? Well, if you're Thomas Thwaites, what you do is you realize that Canada makes coins that are entirely made of nickel. So you just get some Canadian coins and melt them down. That's kind of cheating. Uh, plastic, where do you get plastic from? Pla where do you get plastic from? Oil, yeah. Where do you get oil from? From an oil rig, right? So he phoned BP. <laughs> he said, I've got, a, I've got a jerry can. I'd like to fly out to one of your oil rigs, and I'd like some oil. And for some reason, BP said no. It's not clear why. <laughs> They were so unsupportive of this project, but you know, something about health and safety. Anyway, so he couldn't, get, he couldn't get the plastic from the oil. So then he had a second plan. Turns out you can make plastic from potato starch. So he actually made plastic from potatoes, which sounds very new age and very sustainable. Um, it wasn't that sustainable. The plastic uh, was eaten by slugs. And <laughs> finally, he just, he basically got some plastic and he melted it. To, to transform it into you know, his own plastic. So he's, he's making compromises all the time. He's cheating. He's using high-tech solutions to make a low-tech problem. But he said to me, you know what, Tim? I realized if it's just you naked in the woods and you're trying to make a toaster, you could spend your whole life there. You're never going to get anywhere. These are some of the... Um, some of the various things he used to make the toaster. You see the suitcase full of iron. At least I hope you can. I know the screen's a little dim. You can see the suitcase full of iron, microwave number one, microwave number two, the smelting, uh, the, the bin, which is melted. Uh, I, I think he was trying to do something with lead there. You can see all the different things he was using. Here, this is toast. <laughs> now, I don't know about me, but when I was young, for my birthday, my mother always used to make me special birthday cakes in the shape of something, like a fort or a ladybird or something like that. Now, I'm just trying to get you to imagine what Thomas Twaite's toaster actually looked like. Okay, so imagine your mother made you a birthday cake in the shape of a toaster. And imagine also that your mother was really, really drunk. <laughs> so, this is the toaster that he made. So, um, so I talked to him, he said, I said, so, does it work? He said, well, when I plug it into a car battery, the bread does get warm. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm not sure what will happen when I plug it into the mains. So t Thomas organized this exhibition, he got everyone to come around and look at his toaster and all of that. And at the end of the exhibition, he, there was a little ceremony where he was going to make some toast. He plugged the toaster into the mains, and two seconds later, the toaster was toast, finished. Now, why is this story interesting? Well, maybe it's not interesting, in, in which case I apologize, but you know, only another 20 minutes to go. Um, it's interesting to me because it symbolizes the tremendous complexity of the world around us. So, Bill Gates once said, he was talking about development, he said, you know, the, the the barrier to development isn't too little caring, it's too much complexity. And then he created PowerPoints to prove that he was right. <laughs> now, complexity really is a tremendous barrier to getting a lot of things done in the world. And, and what I want to talk to you about this morning is just how complex the world is and what that means for trying to solve problems in it. If even a toaster turns out to be a difficult problem, and the structure of the global economy is so sophisticated that we can, you can just produce a toaster as if by magic, for 40 minutes work, the minimum wage in the UK. Um, what does that mean for getting things done, for, for solving problems in a complex world? And let, let's face it, the, the world is complex, and it's also highly specialized. So this is a picture of, this is a picture of a Chilean miner. Not one of the really famous Chilean miners, just another Chilean miner. And 
So this Chilean, this, so this guy drives this truck. And you won't, you won't, you, so this is the miner. That's the truck, okay? And that's the mine. It's called the Chiquicamata mine. Um, I deserve a drink for saying that. And the Chiquicamata mine is, is this huge copper mine. And the, you can imagine these gigantic trucks just rolling around and around and around up this incline loaded with uh, copper ore. So the question is, when this, when this driver is, is growling up the, the incline with this huge truck full of copper ore, where's the copper ore going? Is it gonna go to a toaster? Is it gonna make the casing of a bullet? Toaster, bullet, no idea. He has no idea, he doesn't need to know. That's not the way the world economy works. It's full of incredibly specialized people working on very narrow slices of the economy. And if we, if we want the, the world economy to change, if we don't like the way it works out, I mean, often you'll hear economists talking about the complexity of the economy and the miracle of the toaster as though it was something great. And it is great. I mean, it is amazing that you can get this toaster that you couldn't possibly make by yourself. You can get it really easily and it makes perfect toast every time. That's amazing. But it should also give us some pause for thought. Because let's just say there's something you don't like about the world economy. Maybe you think it's perfect. I'm guessing not. Let's say there's something you want to change, something you want to make different. It's an unbelievably complex system with all of these specialists working. And every decision every, every one of these people makes, seven billion people in the world, every decision every one of them makes every day potentially has an impact on other people, has an impact on the climate. And it's all interwoven in a terribly complex way. How many products are there in the economy? Interesting. When I say products, I don't mean, you, know, you imagine sort of going to, uh, going to Gap and looking at trousers in Gap. Um, I, I don't mean every single item on the shelf is a, is a different product. I mean each different type. So you've got the 32-inch jeans and the 34-inch jeans. You've got the, the dark blue jeans and the light blue jeans. So, that, okay, that's four different types of jeans. Gap would call them a, an SKU, a, a stock keeping unit, okay? So how many different kinds of products are in the world? Well, if, you, if you're in a sort of primitive hunter-gatherer society, the, the kind of society our brains evolved in, probably about 300 products. That's sort of an estimate. There's a guy called Eric Beinhocker at the McKinsey Global Institute who, who's a very smart guy who thinks about these things quite a lot. So 300 products in a hunter-gatherer society, you know, there are two kinds of loincloth, there are two kinds of hut, two kinds of stone axe. You know, it's not very complicated. That's what our brains have evolved to deal with. Now, let's say Starbucks. How many products are there in Starbucks? Go and guess how many products Starbucks serve. No? Okay, put your hand up if you think Starbucks serve more products than the entire hunter-gatherer society, more than 300 products. Okay, so a, a little more than half of you think Starbucks is is more complex than the hunter-gatherer society. It kind of is. So Starbucks serves 85,000 different products. Um, Walmart serves 100,000 products. And in New York or London or any large uh, rich city, Beinhocker reckons there are probably about 10 billion different kinds of product, distinct types of product. And each of them potentially more complex than the toaster. And that's the complexity I want us to think about. That's the situation we're facing. We want to change the world, and we've got, we've got 10 billion products and services out there, people going out and consuming these products, producing these products, interacting with these products every day. <coughs> How do we get things to change? So, well, one way we get things to change is we, we find somebody really inspiring and we ask him to change it, and it usually is him, I don't know why. Not him, but you know, a him. So here's Barack Obama. Um, he came up with a lovely satire of excessive expectations uh, in an early speech he gave. It was, a, it was a comic speech in the White House. He said, I think we've achieved a great deal in my first 100 days. I'm proud of the change we've brought to Washington. I want to tell you about the second 100 days. In the second 100 days, I'm going to design and build a library devoted to the first 100 days. <laughs> the second 100 days are going to be so successful I will complete them in 72 days. <laughs> On the 73rd day, I will rest. <laughs> he's mocking the idea. We have this idea that you know, if you just elect the guy in charge, he'll get things done. And if you get rid of the previous guy and get the new guy in, 
then things will get done. Think about the complexity of that society. All those products, all those interactions. There's no one person going to be able to solve that. Now, of course, maybe the leader, we, we're evolved to think about these leaders. Remember 300 products in a primitive hunter-gatherer society? Maybe a, a leader can solve a hunter-gatherer society problem. A leader cannot solve a modern society problem. So maybe the leader gets in an expert. Now, here's an example of an expert um, prediction of the world. So this is by an Oscar-winning director, D.W. Griffith. When a century has passed, all thought of our so-called speaking pictures will have been abandoned. It will never be possible to synchronize the sound with the picture. So he made this forecast in 1924. What's interesting about this forecast is D.W. Griffith was not just some old codger, some, some has-been who made silent films and, would, you know, and just didn't understand that the world was about to change. D.W. Griffith had won his Oscar for a, a film that incorporated sound very fully. He fully believed in the use of sound. He was a pioneer in the use of sound. Um, he used incidental music. He also used speaking voices in his films, but he just synch didn't synchronize them with the acting. They were kind of like sound effects, like background noise, because he just thought it just cannot be done. So this is not just any old Oscar film winning director. This is, <coughs> excuse me, this is a leading authority in the use of sound in pictures. And he says in 1924, there will never be talking pictures. Not for 100 years will there be talking pictures. Three years later, He's proved wrong. Experts get things wrong all the time. Here are um, expert forecasts of the oil price. These, these are the forecasts they made of the oil price in 1981. You can kind of see what they did there. 1984, sort of see what they did there as well. I used to work in the oil industry. It wasn't very difficult to make these forecasts. Um, the only problem is people would sometimes come back and look at what you said, and then it got awkward. There's the forecast in 1987. There's the forecast in 1990. By 1993, they'd kind of finally got it right, except, of course, that's what happened to the oil price. Um, experts get things wrong all the time, all the time. And it's not just a, uh, it's not just a function of, say, a particular kind of expert economic, you know, economists get, sure, economists get things wrong. All experts get things wrong when they're making forecasts. The wonderful 20-year study by a psychologist called Philip Tetlock he studied experts from all sorts of fields, sociologists, political scientists, economists. There were journalists, there were academics, there were diplomats. He studied expert forecasts. And he, Tetlock basically did one brilliant thing, was he kept, just kept a very careful note of all the forecasts and just waited and waited and waited to see if the forecast came true. And it turns out that um, this guy is roughly as good as any of the experts get. Um, so, you know, just uh, any monkey will do you a forecast the same as any expert. But the thing is, if that's true of all experts, that doesn't, I don't think that tells you something about the nature of expertise. I think that tells you something about the nature of the world. The world is just incredibly complex. You, you delegate to a leader, you say, sort our problems out. We want, to solve, we want to solve climate change. We want to solve world poverty. We want to sort out the banks. Please, Mr. Leader, fix it for us. It doesn't work. He assembles a panel of experts. They can't get it right either. The world's too complicated. So how do we solve problems? So um, one, one clue comes from looking at business. And it's not because business leaders are particularly brilliant. They're not. But I think it gives you a very interesting clue. So this is a very famous business book, In Search of Excellence, published in 1982 by Tom Peters and Robert Waterman. Tom Peters went, then went on to be this fantastic business guru, very larger than life. Peters and Waterman studied 43 excellent companies. They wanted to see what made these companies tick. What made these companies succeed? How did these companies solve problems in a complex world? Really, really studied them in detail. And he came to all kinds of conclusions. I guess the conclusions are kind of interesting. What's a lot more interesting is that two years later, one third of those companies were in serious financial trouble. The failure rate was absolutely incredible. Now, maybe it's because you know, Tom Peters is silly, but I don't think so. Failure rate in business is very high. Here's a list of the world's largest, largest companies in 1912. So it's 100 years old. Most of these, most of these companies, <coughs> excuse me, most of these companies have long since failed to uh, prosper. Many of them have gone bankrupt. They've been merged, uh, or they're just extremely obscure. There are three successful companies on this list who are still successful: Exxon, Shell. You know, you can. T we still need oil. Um, so that's maybe not good news. Uh, General Electric. Those are the only three companies on the list that still prosper today. And if you look at the longer list, you see tremendously high failure rates. And it's not just a case of, 
oh, if you look at very big, successful companies in the past, you'll see failure rates. If you look at young, dynamic industries, you also see failure rates. So here's an example. This is the Gutenberg Press. Gutenberg changed the, invented the printing press, changed the modern world. Um, he created this amazing object, the Gutenberg Bible, the 42-line Bible. And you've, he, he's become a modern hero again now. This is all about 550 years ago. Um, suddenly, he's a symbol of blogging and tweeting and Web2 and all this. And Gutenberg changed the world. Everyone likes to talk about Gutenberg. What they don't mention is this bankrupted him. The Gutenberg Bible bankrupted Johannes Gutenberg, right? So it's not a particularly brilliant success. Look at the computer industry. This is the, basically the first personal computer. It was developed at Xerox Park. It was a failure. This is the first uh, laser printer. It was developed at Xerox Park. It was a failure. This is the first laptop. It was developed at Xerox Park. It was a failure. Um, there's a lot of failure, even in tremendously successful industries. We used to this, about 10 years ago, everyone used to talk about Microsoft, the most valuable company in the world. You know, who was going to be the next Microsoft? And suddenly, Microsoft's not so cool anymore. It's been replaced by Google, and it's been replaced by you know, those guys who make phones. And you know, they, they, I can't remember those guys' names. Um, <laughs> they're just, you know, there's a tremendously high failure rate. And that's a very interesting insight, because in the modern economy, businesses solve tremendously complex problems. They solve the toaster problem. They solve all kinds of problems. They don't solve every problem, but they solve the, the, the material wealth problem for a billion or two billion people. In a, and it, the solutions just get more and more amazing every year. And how do they solve these problems? They solve these problems by failing in huge numbers. About 10% of American firms fail every year. The failure rate in the modern economy is enormous. And that is the secret of success. Failure, 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 failure. And then finally, somebody somewhere, the Google guys, the Microsoft guys, somebody comes up with a brilliant idea. Even the person who comes up with a brilliant idea doesn't necessarily profit from the idea. It may well be taken by somebody else, and, and they may run with it. But it's this process of trying out a vast number of different ideas, weeding out the tiny number of successes from the vast number of failures that creates wealth, and also potentially solves other problems. Although we've, we've not got very good at harnessing this evolutionary process of failure to solve problems other than market-related problems. Very good at using them to solve market-related problems. We're not very good at using this process to solve other problems. And I think there are, there are, a, few, uh, there are a few reasons why that's true. I was going to show you some graphs. I don't think I've got time. I just want to show you I've got the graphs, just so you take me seriously. No one. <laughs> No one takes me see There were some graphs there, OK? I'm qu quite happy to talk about my graphs later. I, I want to talk about people instead of graphs for a second. So let's, let's just, where, where are we? We're in a situation where we've got an incredibly complex economy. It's unbelievably good at solving the kinds of problems it solves, although it leaves other very important problems unsolved. How does it solve these problems? These are problems like, how do you get this incredibly complex item like this toaster available to somebody for the equivalent of 40 minutes' work? How's the problem solved? The problem is solved through trial and error. Trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. The first toaster, by the way, not very good. Used to electrocute people, cause fires, rust. It, it took about 50 years before they finally figured out that the right way to make a toaster. The, the toasting problem, by the way, is really old. Romans loved toast. But the toaster it took until about 1940 50 years of trying, it's true, 50 years of trying before you finally figure out, hey, you put the toast on the inside and you, you push it up and down. If you put the toast on the outside, it means you've got the heating elements on the outside, which means you, know, you, will, you will kill people. So they finally figured out the, the toasting problem. A lot of trial and error. OK, so if trial and error is the way that complex problems get solved, well, that's fine. We, 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 hear, we often hear people say, Oh, you know, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. We hear people say, learn from your mistakes. That sounds like nice advice. And, you know, we, we really value it. We, you know, we, for example, in our politicians, okay, here are two politicians, okay? There's uh, George Bush and John Kerry. So one guy basically changed his mind a lot, and the, the other guy never changed his mind about anything. And, you know, and we, 
we clearly, you know, we, everybody voted for the guy who, who experimented and, and made U-turns, yeah? Oh no, they voted for the other guy. They voted for the guy who never changed his mind about anything. In the UK, so we've had, who are the two most successful politicians in the UK um, since the war? Margaret Thatcher, Tony Blair. They both won three general elections. Representative quote, Tony Blair, I don't have a reverse gear. Margaret Thatcher, you turn if you want to, the lady's not for turning. Now, would you buy a car that didn't reverse or turn? <laughs> I wouldn't. But we find them very attractive qualities in politicians. This is a politician from the right, a politician from the left, basically saying, I've set my course, I'm not going to change. That, for some reason, is very, very attractive. And that's difficult, because actually, if, if I'm right about how complex problems get solved, complex problems get solved by lots and lots of people experimenting, trying, failing. And we just, as, as voters, we don't like that. We don't want to vote for a politician who says, you know what? I want to solve the country's education problems. I don't really know how to do that. We don't really have very good evidence. I'm kind of thinking it might be something to do with maybe changing the pay of the way teachers get paid. Or maybe it's, it's actually to do with earlier schooling. Or maybe it's later schooling. Or it might be smaller classes. Or maybe it's actually all about the school environment. Or it could be about reaching out to parents. Or maybe it's none of those things. Or maybe it's all of those things. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try a bunch of stuff and we'll measure everything really carefully. Most of it will probably fail, and then we'll stick with the stuff that works. Has anybody ever voted? Has anybody ever said this in politics? <laughs> has anybody ever voted for this person in politics? That, this, is not, this is not what happens. Um, people don't like experimentation. They don't like experimentation in business. And to be honest, we find it very difficult to experiment in our, in our um, personal lives. So uh, this, is, this guy, his nickname is Jesus. He's a poker player. He's, he's very good. He's a computer scientist. Um, I interviewed him a few years ago for a, for a book. Um, he plays like a computer. He's able to sort of calculate all the probabilities. But he tells me, you know, you, in the end, you can't play poker like a computer because you have, to ad you have to adjust for the fact that your opponents are not computers. They'll make mistakes. And he said, and he, he said this, is the mis this is the mistake that they really, the most common mistake to look out for. So poker's a game of luck like life. There's a lot of luck. There's skill, but there's also a lot of luck. So you can make a good decision that turns out doesn't work out. You, you think about it. You've all made a good decision that later on it was like, that was unlucky, that didn't work. In poker, it happens a lot. Here's the mistake. After you've made the decision that, for whatever reason, didn't work out, you then go crazy. Because you've lost money and the other guy's got the, your money, and you still think it's your money, and why has he got your money? It's actually your, it's not his money, it's your money, you want his money, but it's not his money, it's your money, and you're gonna win his, and you just start, you start to get angry. Poker players say that you go on tilt. People react in a, in a very strange way to having made a mistake. Sometimes they go into denial. They say, I, there was no mistake, I never made a mistake. It was, sometimes they go into blame. It wasn't my mistake, it was his mistake. He made the mistake. I didn't make the mistake. It was entirely his fault. Uh, or they will start gambling. They will go on tilt, is how poker players describe it. But we find it really, really hard to respond to failure in our personal lives. We find it really hard to respond to failure as voters. We find it really hard to respond to failure as organizations. And yet the truth is, success so often starts with failure. Think about Johannes Gutenberg, the Gutenberg Bible. The Gutenberg Bible was a failure. Johannes Gutenberg was a failure. He changed the world. How do we deal with that? I just want to do a quick show of hands. Who here has failed in some important project that meant, maybe it was a personal thing, maybe it was a business thing, failed in something that meant a lot to them? Yeah. So it does happen. Did anybody not put their hands up? <laughs> I was hoping we would meet the one person who never failed, but turns out, turns out she's not here yet. OK. Fine. That, it happens. It, that response to failure is tremendously difficult. Also, the response to success, recognizing that something is succeeding, letting the success spread. 
See, the thing that strikes me is, I don't know how many people are here, 150 people, 200, 150 people. It seems to me the problems that you are trying to solve are so complex, the world that surrounds us is so complex, it's entirely possible that 149 of you will fail. And there's one person in the room who, is going to, who has some project, has some idea, it's a technology, it's a technique, it's a message that is going to be completely transformational. It's going to alter the way 10 billion products are made. It's going to alter the way 2 billion people behave. It's going to transform the, the dialogue. It's, going, it's an idea that's going to spread. That's entirely possible. That's, that's actually how the world works. The mo the, these huge high impact ideas are built on a long tangled mess of constant failure. And it's just the one idea. And it's the one idea that's enough. If that idea spreads, that's enough. So the challenge here is, there are 150 people here, and it's entirely possible that 149 of you are going to get nowhere. And there's one person in this room who is going to succeed. The realization that that will do, that is the success rate that is acceptable. And the other 149 of you are going to have to drop what you're doing and support that person. That's not easy for any human being to take. But that is my belief about the way the world often works. The human race fails constantly, repeatedly. We're incredibly good at failure. And yet somehow, out of failure, comes success. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you.